on vector displays, and I've had one of my fellow contributors from uh, the CMU Computer Club, Michael Dilley, uh, helped me out with uh, some of the slides. Um, and so he's not here, he's in California, but uh, I'm sure that he wishes he could be here. Uh, so a bit about me, I'm a software engineer at uh, NetApp in Pittsburgh. I'm a member of the CMU Computer Club, and I have way too many hobbies, which means that I you can't devote as much time as I'd like to any given thing, but I have a lot of fun. Um, quick uh, uh, thing, um, the CMU Computer Club puts on Demo Splash uh, every October in Pittsburgh, and it's awesome, and you should all come. All right, so a uh, quick outline of what I'm gonna cover in my talk. I'm going to start by saying what a vector display is, kind of how it compares to other types of displays. Then I'm gonna go over some examples and then talk about if you think these vector displays and vector graphics are cool, what can you actually do if you wanna make a uh, demo or a game that uh, uses vector graphics? So first, We'll answer the question, what's a vector display? To start, we need to uh, get some more background on how displays work in general. So historically, the uh, display device that's most commonly been used um, in computers and televisions has been a uh, cathode ray tube. Uh, the basic idea is that you've got an electron gun or electron guns that are in the tube's neck. They fire at the screen, which is coated with phosphors. When the electron gun hits the screen, uh, that area of the screen illuminates it, and you can use that to uh, vary the brightness, draw images, various things. Uh, you aim that electron beam with either magnetic coils or electrostatic plates. Um, and as I said, the phosphor coating uh, fluoresces because of the beam. And so here's a uh, picture of what this looks like. You see you have the electron gun in the back, uh, and then your magnetics for controlling the beam, and then the screen in the front that uh, will actually have the phosphors that will illuminate. But again, how do you use a CRT to display the image? Most of the time, uh, what you'll see is a uh, raster display where you basically have an electron beam that's uh, continually following the same pattern where it like line by line by line uh, goes across the screen. And so you can like turn the beam off and adjust the uh, brightness uh, as you go along the line and that's how you get your pixels. And so this gives you, you know, this rectangular array that we all know and love and are very familiar with. Um, and so here's sort of a picture of this sort of monotonous, you know, continual uh, process that the electron beam does on a uh, raster display. Um, and this is how you can uh, create like a happy face. So you can see uh, I've colored the uh, beam path uh, when the intensity is low, kind of that light blue. And then the pixels that you want to illuminate are that green. So you can sort of use it as a grid to make your image like that uh, smiley face. In vector displays, though, you're not stuck with that uh, monotony where you're like limited to this grid. Um, instead, you actually sweep your electron beam to various positions in order to draw the lines or shapes that you want to use. So, instead of that, you know, grid pattern, right? You just kind of move the beam around. And so, if I wanted to draw a similar smiley face with a vector display, right? You could start there at the nose, turn the beam on, kind of draw that little curve, right? T turn it off, go make a dot for each of the eyes, and then continue to go make the, uh, the mouth. All right, so now I'm going to move on to more of the uh, example uh, part of the uh, talk. So does anybody know what this is? Yeah, that's actually Space War. It's, yes, the Type 30 display on a PDP-1. Uh, if you haven't been out to the uh, Computer History Museum in uh, Mountain View, California, uh, one of the things that you can do when you're there is you can actually uh, go up to the PDP-1 and actually play Space War on it. And it's actually you know, pretty relevant to um, MIT as well because that's where, where they made it. Um, so actually the... Um, Space War and the uh, Type 30 display on the PDP-1 wasn't actually a vector display. It was actually sort of in between. The programming interface for that is that you gave the monitor 
a 10-bit uh, x-coordinate, a 10-bit y-coordinate, and an intensity. And you'd tell it this, you'd wait for a bit, and it would draw a dot. And to draw an image, you just had to draw a lot of dots. And I, I think this must have taken quite a while, but uh, you were still able to get uh, you know, images that you know, weren't too flickery because they used um, phosphors with uh, high persistence in that delay, in that display. Well, now I'm actually going to go over some examples of some vector displays. So uh, they were actually pretty common uh, for early computers because I think maybe to some extent it was easier to you know, sweep the beam around and make lines and shapes than to be able to you know, continuously supply the uh, data that was required to um, draw each pixel in a uh, raster display. So on the left is one of the uh, Sage uh, Situation Display console terminals uh, that were used. I think that was the, uh, I forget what it stands for now, um, but it was uh, sort of an error monitoring system from the uh, Cold War. And so what you do at that terminal is it would show you kind of like an outline of like the coastline or the airspace that you're working with and it would overlay it with images for uh, various aircraft um, that you'd see. And actually one thing that was really interested, interesting is that to the best of our knowledge, the first instance of computer art ever was done on one of those uh, Sage displays. There's uh, an article, I think, um, in the Atlantic uh, that uh, talks about that. And so, of course, it was like a, a girl from a pinup calendar. Um, but uh, so that, that's pretty cool. And then on the right, there's an IBM 2250 uh, display, which was a uh, display terminal that IBM made for the uh, System 360. And actually, you can see that a woman there um, has a light pen. And that actually was from a sort of like early hypertext uh, system where you could uh, read text. And if you saw something that was interesting, you could use the light pen, uh, light pen to select the text that you're interested in and uh, go and see more about that information. It also has been used pretty frequently um, uh, until pretty recently uh, for some pretty specialized displays like uh, you know, radar screens for uh, air traffic control. I think they're, they're moving away from some of the vector displays now. Uh, I think largely because LCDs are, are cheap now and you can uh, do a lot more things, easier to, to get parts. Um, another case where uh, vector displays have been common has been in displays for uh, airplanes actually. It's one of the um, advantages that you get from a vector display is you can get um, a higher contrast and a brighter display and that can make it easier to see. Another thing that's kind of like a, uh, a vector display is that for uh, concerts and shows you can use uh, laser projectors which well, they, they work by a different principle. Instead, you're you know aiming aiming a laser at uh, you know a screen or at a foggy uh, uh, airspace in an auditorium, but you still do get to sort of control what the beam's doing in the same way, where you control how it's pointing in the uh, x-axis and how it's pointing in the y-axis. I uh, actually. Uh, I uh, can't guarantee whether we're uh, going to be able to do this, but we're actually going to try and feature a uh, laser projector at our next iteration of uh, Demo Splash for some um, demos. And so that will be uh, really neat if we can uh, get that working. And sort of the, one of the most famous things that um, vector displays are known for is various arcade games. This is Space Wars uh, with an S, though it was actually based on um, Space War for the PDP-1. The um, uh, gentleman who uh, developed this game was inspired because he'd been to MIT and saw Space War and so he was like, I want to build my own. Um, and so he did and 
he uh, licensed it to an arcade manufacturer, and it was the first uh, vector arcade game. And there have been many different uh, vector arcade games. Uh, I think everybody is familiar with Asteroids. And in some of the uh, later uh, arcade games, you actually started to get uh, color vector displays uh, in Tempest, for example. And that actually, you don't really see color vector displays all that commonly. Uh, when, when the Vectrex came as a home system, I think they were sort of interested in doing it in color, but the uh, uh, cost of the color screen kind of made that uh, prohibitive. And another vector display that uh, we've got here as a nice example would be uh, an oscilloscope. The uh, actual usual purpose for an oscilloscope is to show how waveforms, electrical waveforms, how their voltage varies over time. That often can be very useful when you're debugging a circuit because you're like, okay, well, I know the signal is supposed to be doing this, and so you can actually visualize what the uh, signal is doing if you hook your signal up to an oscilloscope. And so the typical mode for an oscilloscope is that you basically um, sweep the beam in the X direction at uh, a constant rate, and then you basically use the voltage you're applying as the Y deflection and so that gives you a nice plot of your signal over time. But you can also put your oscilloscope in uh, XY mode where you can use apply two different voltages to two different inputs and then it will plot one voltage on uh, the x-axis and another voltage on the y-axis. And so here are some examples and uh, Pardon the fact that I'm not very good at uh, French pronunciation. These are uh, Lisa Ju uh, curves, which are a way to sort of visualize the um, uh, relationship between uh, different waveforms. So you can uh, sort of like visualize and compare the uh, differing um, frequencies and phase relationships. So. Um, for this uh, example on the oscilloscope up at the top, you can see that there are one, two, three lobes um, in the X direction, and then two in the Y direction. And so that tells you that um, one of the waveforms that you're using as an input is um, that they've got a ratio of frequencies of uh, three to two. And so, as the phase changes, also you kind of get you know, a line versus a circle versus um, an ellipse. And then one of the favorites is the Vectrex, which I think to the best of my knowledge is the only uh, sort of home console that used a uh, vector display. And I believe it came out in uh, 1982, and it's really cool. And one of the uh, really sort of cool uh, peripherals that the Vectrex worked with was a 3D imager. And so how this worked is that you'd wear this you know, sort of you know, futuristic looking uh, goggle thing on your head and it contained a, a basically a spinning color wheel uh, where half of it was blank. And so by timing when things were displayed on the screen, with the rotation of that spinning color wheel, you could you know, make it so your left eye would see some things and your right eye would see other things, and that would cause a 3D effect. It also allowed you to use color to a limited extent on the Vectrex because you could make different parts of the wheel different colors. And so you'd know, okay, if I draw this when the color wheel's red, this is going to be a red line now instead of a white line. And actually, there are sort of homebrew versions of the uh, 3D imager uh, as well, because the original one uh, is kind of rare. Um, but some people have been able to recreate the, the way that it works. Now I'm going to move on to the third part of the presentation, where I talk about, OK, I, uh, 
want to want to do this. I like these vector graphics. What can I do? So with oscilloscopes, that's actually probably one of the easier ways to, to get into this. What you can do is you can put your oscilloscope in the XY mode and then you can use reasonably low voltages. I say low because if you're actually trying to drive, drive the uh, deflection plates or coils of a CRT, you need like ridiculous voltages to, to make that work. But if you use an oscilloscope, the whole idea is it has amplifiers so you can you know, use whatever signal range that you want. And so the, the way that it works, again, is uh, on your X channel, uh, your voltage specifies where on the plane your dot's going to be, and your voltage on the Y channel specifies the Y coordinate. And another thing that's interesting that I wasn't really all that aware of until I looked at the uh, back of uh, the oscilloscope uh, that I've worked with in Pittsburgh is that some of them actually even have a third input for controlling the intensity. And so at that point, you basically have a you know, completely general purpose vector display. So that's really cool. So I'm going to sort of go over a brief example of how, how the XY mode works, where I'm going to show the input voltages on each the channel and how you can use that to uh, draw a shape. If you've if you remember doing uh, parametric uh, graphing uh, as part of mathematics, you know, it's basically the same idea. So in this case, I've got a, um, a cosine on the X channel and a uh, sine on the Y channel. And so if at this point in time we go and plot the dot on the XY screen, right, we get, get that spot there at, you know, 1, 0. And so as time goes on, right, as we change the voltages, that dot moves. And if you keep going, right, eventually you've drawn a circle. Now one thing, as uh, you know, at least I know that I uh, generally prefer to work with uh, digital electronics and things that you get out of computers and microcontrollers and things like that. But if you're going to drive an oscilloscope, you actually need to be able to specify the voltage of your signal. And so you need a, uh, a DAC to, to be able to do that, to go from your digital signals to an analog signal. But uh, fortunately, there are many choices. So one thing that's kind of cool is if you've got a PC, you probably have at least two DACs. Um, they're generally used for uh, sound, uh, but there are some limitations that you uh, get from using a sound card, uh, namely that in a lot of cases you'll have a, a low-pass filter which is basically just trying to block out the uh, uh, frequencies of sound that like, you can't actually hear. Um, and it can help clean up the way that the audio sounds. But uh, the problem is, is that means that it's going to like, slow down your uh, voltage changes so you can't move the beam as quickly. Another thing is that, like for sound waves, right? You never just like you know go to the positive voltages, right? You actually alternate to create the uh, vibrations in the air, and so that means that usually uh, your audio output's going to be uh, AC coupled, uh, which means that you can't actually say, okay, I want to you know continually output a you know point at one comma one because it's going to go up to your corner for a little bit, but then as the uh, you know, capacitor on the output charges, right, it's um, going to stop passing the current and then your uh, voltage is going to go back to zero. So you need to be careful to um, alternate which side of zero your signals are in so that you don't have that happen. But you can actually still um, uh, get a lot of um, out of doing this, and so I, I think at this point I'm going to uh, try and uh, show an example of an oscilloscope demo uh, that actually does make use of output from a sound card. And so let me get that set up. Yes.
All right, that was Uscope, uh, which I think was released at Assembly in 2007, if I remember correctly. But so yeah, that, that again was basically I was using my uh, cell phone to play a .flag file and that made the graphics and then uh, in addition I was playing the soundtrack on a uh, laptop. And so I actually I wasn't originally intending to uh, show it on my phone. I actually picked up a uh, um, USB sound card um, that I think would probably be pretty lousy as a sound card, but worked really well for this because it had like absolutely no output filtering, and so it made for nice sharp lines on the oscilloscope. Um, and so thinking about that, one thing that's cool is then you could actually uh, do your demo and your soundtrack on one device, um, and you could even generate in, generate it in real time. So uh, I think that would be fun. <laughs> Um, if you want uh, to use a DAC, you can also um, kind of build your own hardware. One really popular thing to do with an oscilloscope is use a microcontroller to make it into a clock. I don't really know why. <laughs> and here's another really cool hack that uh, I uh, found using an oscilloscope. So what? Um, what he's doing in this case is he's actually hooked into the uh, video signals generated by a Game Boy. And then he's got an X Mega board that he's using to process them. And then he's actually doing a raster scan on the oscilloscope display and uh, controlling the intensity with um, the intensity input that his scope has. And so if you want to play Game Boy games on your oscilloscope, you can. You can do it. Um, the other sort of accessible uh, hardware that you can get that has a vector display would be the Vectrex, since it was a uh, home video game system. And basically, it has hardware that's designed for uh, sweeping lines. And so you don't actually you know, continuously supply uh, values for your DAX. Uh, instead, you basically end up setting a velocity um, for your x and y directions, and then you tell it to sweep and then wait for it to go ahead and draw the line. And it's actually really, really cool, the uh, uh, design that they used, because they actually got away with using only one DAC. And the uh, way that they accomplished this is they used the DAC output uh, in an analog multiplexer. And then on the uh, Y velocity and intensity uh, circuits, they've got a uh, sample and hold circuit where you can basically tell it, okay, this is the Y velocity that I want to use. Right? It will then remember that. You can tell it your intensity. And then you can set your X velocity as you want. And you've also got these control signals for uh, turning the beam on and off. The beam on-off controls actually um, the uh, output of the shift register on the uh, 6522, uh, and so you can use that to like very easily draw dashed patterns, for example. Um, and then you can t uh, indicate whether or not you want the beam to sweep, and you can also clamp the location to center. And it turns out, based on uh, the fact that the hold circuit, you know, kind of um, I think mostly they kind of drift towards ground over time. Uh, it's important that you uh, get yourself a solid reference point every now and then uh, if you want to um, draw your lines anywhere you want them, near where you want them to be. And so again, this is how you draw a line. Uh, you set your values and um, basically wait until the line draws. And if you want to draw a scene, you draw a whole bunch of lines and uh, you, know, you move the beam with the um, intensity turned down or it actually turned off so the control signals turn it off um, when you don't want to draw lines. And again, as I said, you need to return to zero, zero or else you're going to flicker or, or else your location is going to end up being wrong. And if you draw too many, uh, you can have flickering. And, um, one of the things that's really interesting about the uh, hardware is it leads to some sort of like characteristic artifacts that 
I don't know, I think they're kind of cool. So you can see this is um, from Wine Art by uh, Nuance and Metal Bots. Um, and so they're like drawing the uh, OpenGL teapot, I think. But again, because you like can't really, um, because you specify the velocity, you're not really guaranteed that the position you're going to get into is going to be exactly where you want it to be. Uh, so it can be really hard to make your uh, like closed shapes line up together. Another thing that's sort of interesting that you can't really see in any videos, but you'll notice if you actually use a Vectrex, is that based on the way uh, that you position and then start sweeping, you end up with a little bright dot at the start of every line that you draw. And so that's sort of an interesting artifact that you get. So if you want to do some Vectrex programming, uh, there are a lot of very useful ROM functions that implement the drawing operations. And actually, there's a really interesting video where Jay Smith um, who was one of the creators of the Vectrex, was sort of like describing the hardware and some of the decisions that were made when they were building it. And, um, and he was like, yeah, the reason why we wanted to make a vector system is because if you've got a like sprite or a pixel-based system, what you need to do if you want to scale or rotate an image? Well, you basically need another image. And so that's kind of a pain. But if you're doing vector programming, uh, scaling is really, really easy. You just may let the beam sweep a little bit longer um, when you're drawing your shape, and then it's bigger. Um, if you want to rotate it, well, all you need to do is you know apply the transformation to your points, and then you've got your figure, and it's rotated. And it's a lot easier than trying to you know, in interpolate pixels to um, do that. And so another thing, and one of the reasons why I really enjoyed working on Where Have All the Pixels Gone, which was a uh, demo that CMUCC did for the Vectrex, is that despite the fact that the specs of the system looked really limiting, it, it turned out that it wasn't really that bad. You know, it only had one kilobyte of RAM, but we didn't really have any graphics that we had to uh, you know, manipulate with them. I mean, we had our vector graphics, but you know, we could we could basically store those in in ROM, um, and so we, we were limited in what we had to manipulate. And in the processor was only 1.5 megahertz, but it, it turned out that we really spent most of the time just waiting for the beam to move anyway. So <laughs> it wasn't like that uh, that slowed us down. And so if you're interested in uh, uh, Vectrex programming, they've got resources at playvectrex.com that are, are very good. Uh, and another thing that's useful is that uh, uh, Smith Engineering, who made the Vectrex, actually made uh, most of their uh, ROMs and uh, even some of their source code uh, available for non-commercial use. So it, you can easily get schematics to see how it works. Um, and code doing various things. And so again, like you might be want to might think, okay, I'm sold on vector graphics. What can I do? But I th th probably most of us don't have a Vectrex or an oscilloscope. Oscilloscopes are pretty easy to get, but they're they can be expensive. Well, if you want to you know experiment with Vectrex, uh, there are several emulators that work very well. Uh, we we used them when we were developing Where Have All the Pixels Gone, um, and they were very helpful because, you know, we were sometimes working sort of in a dispersed manner, and that meant we could test our things out without actually having physical access to a Vectrex. But you lose some of the funny vector artifacts that you get, so the, the result's not quite the same. Another thing uh, that uh, I think could be interesting is that if you like the aesthetic, um, I'm pretty sure you could use a GPU to, to draw lines and you know maybe come up with some, some effects to uh, emulate that glow. Um, and so I, I think that could be a, a fun way to give like a sort of old school characteristic to a uh, modern demo. Another thing um, that I've been thinking about is that, as I said, the uh, a vector display mostly differs from a raster display in how the beam is controlled. So 
I, I'm not going to recommend that anybody do this because you know it, the, there are reasons why it says that you shouldn't open up your TV. Um, but I think that there could be a possibility that you could mod some other sort of display device to work as a uh, vector display. And so that could be really cool because uh, the really the only color vector devices that I know of, I mean, maybe there were like specialized things for air con traffic control, would be like Tempest and the other color Atari vector games, which means that I don't think anybody has written a color vector demo. And so I think it would be really cool to see one. And that's all of my talk. So thank you very much. Yes? Well, another reason not to try to convert an old TV is that the voltage that uh, drives the electrons towards the screen depends on the horizontal motion of the, uh, of the, of the electron beam. Okay. The circuits are combined. So it probably wouldn't be too practical to do even to say Right, because the flyback also generates that high voltage. Yeah. Yes? How do color uh, vector displays work? So there are actually a, a couple different ways that you could do a color vector display. There was actually, but because of the uh, video game crash, this never happened. But um, Jay Smith was actually saying that they had started developing a color version of the Vectrex um, in sort of 83 time frame. And so, again, a normal color television actually will have uh, three electron beams that it will shoot towards the screen. And you'll actually use the same magnetics to, to do the deflection, but you keep the beam that you don't want from hitting the colors, the incorrect colors, with a uh, shadow mask, which is basically a you know, sort of perforated plate that has like openings that are just in the right spot. So like the green beam can hit the green phosphors, but the red beam and the blue beam can't. Um, and so the uh, Atari arcade games actually did basically use just a sort of color tube like that. Um, one of the things that you sort of lose on is you lose some of the resolution because of the, the shadow mask. What the um, Vectrex guys are trying to do, uh, and again, mostly for cost reasons, because you know three times some of the equipment for the color, adding a shadow mask that gets expensive. What they actually tried to do is they tried to do a um, screen where they had two different phosphor layers, and so they'd have a green layer and a red layer, and depending on how long you, um, or with what intensity you shine the beam at the spot, it would either illuminate one or both of those layers. And so you could sort of get like, you know, sort of a continuum between like two different colors with that method. Anything else? Val? So if you were going to try to build your own thing, pack it together from existing stuff, the televisions would work. I mean, if, let's say you were doing a project like that, what bits would you go scrounging around? I actually have no idea. So uh, again, um, yeah, you, you could. The, I don't know exactly what difficulties are involved. One, one thing that the uh, uh, Jay Smith referenced in the video that I mentioned is that while they used a standard black and white TV tube uh, for the Vectrex, they said, like, yeah, we went for nine inches because that was uh, you know, both cheaper than a five inch and cheaper than a 12 inch. And they're like, yeah, it was like ten, fifteen dollars. Um, but they actually did have to modify the magnetics. And he said the reason for that is that if you think of that raster pattern that I showed, in the vertical axis, you aren't ever really moving very quickly. Whereas if you're doing a vector display, you want to be able to move in the y direction at the same speed um, as you're moving in the x direction. And I actually just learned yesterday that uh, Kevin um, from SceneSat is actually actually trying to do this, uh, I think, for a, an arcade system. And he said he was having some trouble with the uh, inductance. So. And in case you couldn't hear, he said it's doable. It's tough to make it look right. Tim? So you said the, um, the demo you showed on the oscilloscope here was from 2007 at assembly? 
I don't remember the exact year. It was 2007, and it was from 70. It was actually done by a 15-year-old who was grounded and didn't get to go to the award ceremony for staying up late the previous night. <laughs> well, that's terrible. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't really know the time frame because there, there have been several groups. I mean, there aren't very many Vectrex demos, but there have been, you know, I, I think probably on the order of like five to ten Vectrex demos. Um, and so I don't know when the time frame that would have um, compared to, to Uscope. And I actually don't know when the like whole craziness with oscilloscope clocks started either. <laughs> Yes, yes. So the, the, basically the way that you would drive a laser projector would be the same way that you'd uh, you know, drive the CRT. Again, you apply different voltages for X and Y, and it will cause the um, galvos and mirrors in the laser projector to uh, basically track to different locations. And so it's, it's very similar. You also can turn it on and off and sometimes control the intensity. Any last questions? All right, seeing none, let's move on.